The first step on our salmon's journey from the classroom to the hatchery is to catch them in the tank. These salmon fry are extremely fast and tricky, so it takes us a while to get them into two buckets. Each bucket has an aeration system so that the salmon can breathe on their long journey to the hatchery. at the Chelan Hatchery with Corey Morrison. Hello. And he's gonna talk to you about the salmon just as if you were here. And then we're gonna release your salmon into the stream and they're gonna live happy salmon lives. So, um. Real so, quickly, I just wanna mm -hmm. say you guys did an awesome job on these. I see some future fish hatchery specialists right here. Keep up the good work. They look very nice. So what, what we do, um, normally, and in this case is your guys' fish, is that anytime we plant them, we try, when they're coming from a hatchery to a river or stream or whatever, we try to get the water temp as close as possible so it doesn't stress them out. Um, a lot of times when, in fish, when they get stressed, um, it can cause disease outbreaks and they can die. So we want to minimize any stress-related issues that that could happen. And one of the ways is by water temp. So for smaller fish, and that's what we are, we're at 56 degrees here and 54 in the bucket. So they should have an easy transition between the buckets and the, and the stream. Yeah, can you talk to us why we, we went with a dark bucket instead of like an orange bucket? Right, so one thing, again, we, we talk about uh, stress related things. Uh, dark buckets, work very well keeps the fish uh, calm um, in the hatchery settings in here a lot of a lot of the places are very dark and the only time that we'll turn on the light is in the morning when we clean them um, and so we can see um, otherwise we like to keep them mellow uh, uh, and then how long so when we release the fish into the stream how long are they going to be in that stream um, you know these fish here, these are, if I believe, our summer chinook, mm -hmm. right? So they could smolt, which means that they lose their scales and they get this instinct to go to the ocean. Um, they could smolt twice within a year. Oh, wow. Um, most likely, and then a lot of that depends on their size um, when, when that happens. Um, with these little guys here, um, I would say probably only once because of their size. So it'd be a year from now. Um, Aprilish is when they'll stay in the stream or in this part of the stream, and they'll get the urge. Um, they get all bright and silver, and, and they just have the urge to head to the ocean. And so um, sometimes from here, from Chelan down to McNary Dam, uh, we have one group down to Chelan Falls Hatchery, which mm -hmm. are would have been last year's babies just like this. It took them 22 days, which was actually phenomenal. The sooner you can get them through all the predators and get them to the ocean, we feel really good that we did our part um, in that part. So yeah, basically about a year, they'll stay in the streams. Okay. And then how many salmon will survive? So we had 246, or you guys did a really good job. You started with 250. Yeah, that's awesome. So how many will come back? Well, you know, what is it? Um, probably less than 1% will come back. So you might have two. Two salmon? Two. That's all right. That, that was the two that was your favorite, guys. That was Billy and Jenny, right? Billy and Jenny. <laughs> and the reason for that is all the different predators um, that they have to go through for that many miles down, and they're and they're little. Um, and you you look at you know, some sea lions. Sea lions love fish. Uh, Ultra whales love salmon. Um, lots of different ducks, mergansers, loons. They like salmon also. So um, that's why it's really important to try to build up enough adults coming back to put off enough offspring to keep the whole cycle going. Mm. So yeah, if you have a your two favorites, root them on in, in, in uh, three to five years. They, they should come back. So then, how do we? How do you guys keep track of the salmon? Do you do you know them by their face or? We do it a little differently because 
we have lots of Jennings and Billies. Uh, we'll have one that we'll name that's a little bit different than everybody else. He might have a different pigmentation. He might not be the same color. Um, and so those are kind of our favorites. Um, or they're albino, um, which means they don't have any pigments. And you can look, almost look right through them. So those are how we name them. Um, otherwise, a lot of things we'll do, since we're dealing with lots of numbers, um, say 600,000, currently what we're doing down there, is that uh, all those are ad clip. They take the little adipose fin right off your back, not the big one, but the little one, between the back and the tail, clip that off so we know it's a hatchery fish. And so that way we have, in a grand scale, we know how many hatchery fish, you know, they go down and there's different type of uh, checking stations down, so on and so forth. Then the other way that we take a subsample, a smaller piece of that group, is we put pit tags, little computer chips. We put them in their belly mm -hmm. and then they can be wandered. Mm -hmm. And that gives them the information um, of where they came from. So you just ru you just want like run a like a metal rod like, over the fish. Yep. And it little, and the, and yep. the computer beeps and it says beeps, number it says, 105. Yep. It's kind of like us all having a social security number. Okay. We give social security numbers to fish. So that way we can keep <laughs> track of downstream migration and also can, can keep track it's a little harder when things get out in the ocean uh, because a lot of these fish will spend I said they'll leave the fresh water here, make it to the ocean in a year, they'll go up to British Columbia for a year, up to Alaska for a year, oh, wow. and make the jaunt all the way back down. So it could be, depending on um, what their mindset is, they could be, they stay out in the ocean for two years and come back, they could stay out in the ocean three to four years and come back. So they come back at different sizes. And so, so once they get out in the ocean, it's really hard for us to keep track of the big unknown. Um, but when they start coming back as adults, as they're coming up the fish ladders, they can wand them again. Huh. And they'll have a group of fish and they'll they'll actually say, okay, out of these 20 fish, two of them had okay. these pit tags and they just, you know, they do a percentage okay. about how many fish have came back from that run. So that's how that's done on a yearly basis. Say like down below, uh, I believe, what do we have? Out uh, of 600,000, I think there's like 10,000 that have pit wow. tags. And so usually what they find is they run in schools. So we always hear about you know, fish at fish schools. And so they'll run together. So they have a good idea, for the most part, that that group of fish with that pit tag is his brothers and sisters. Okay. So that's how they kind of can determine some of the percentages of what come back. Well, that's really cool. <laughs> so, um, I'm going to hand you a cup. Okay. And you're going to scoop a fish. Okay, let me get this out of your finger here. Out of your, your thermometer there. Yep. And then I'm going to have a cup. And we're going to scoop a fish. And then are we going to release the fish by themselves? Or do you want them together? Well, let's see. This could be tough. All right, I got at least. You got one? I got one. I got one. I got two. Yeah, I guess I okay, got we got two, two here. Very nice looking. Very active. Um, had you seen, you see how active they are now? They're out in the sunlight. If you look in the bucket, they're kind of really calm. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, this is kind of what we're talking about, the light and the dark darkness. Oh, they look great. So we picked this spot here. Okay. Um, I'm gonna come up here, so hopefully so there's a, this nice little oh, um, nice hiding looking. spot for them, to them to get used to, because it'll okay. take a little bit for them to get used to. And so they do it like that. Um, so normally when we release them, we release them in a bunch. Mm -hmm. And the biggest reason for that is uh, when you re release them in small groups, if you have any bigger fish or any predators, it takes these guys a little while to figure out where they're at. Mm. And so you dump them by numbers knowing, unfortunately, some of them are gonna get angry. So mm. I would suggest that we probably dump the rest of them all okay. together okay. so they can all be together and find their own little pass um, rather than one by one. Okay. No, I figured this was a good spot because we do have some adults that could come back and spawn here. Yeah. So they'll have some 
cousins. So this little bucket looking thing is what we call the man feeder. It has a little wire down here and we can actually teach them to hit that wire. Really? Do you have a second they should come over? Do they feed themselves? Yeah. <laughs> and what's in there? These are triploid rainbows. Some of these will be the ones that get you get the little tag for the derby fish. So if you go fishing in a derby, there's a strong chance that you got a fish from Corey. And yes. the Cache Land Hatchery open to the public? Because if they want to come with their families? Yeah, or, well. Not right now. Yeah. But usually. Yes, we're open seven days a week. Um, um, 8 to 4.30. Um, and it's, for the most part, it's a self-guided tour unless you get a bunch of people and then we'll be happy to give you a tour. Um, but yeah, we're op open all the time. We come down and look. Um, once we get past this little virus issue we're going through now, uh, we can give tours inside of, of mm. uh, baby fish and that kind of stuff. Um, we're one of the unique hatcheries in the state is that we raise so many different types. Mm. Uh, Brook trout, brown trout, tiger trout, cutthroat trout, two different groups of coconut, wow. two different stocks of rainbow, steelhead. Um, we have the schmook down below. Um, we did raise sturgeon. Now uh, we'll get back into that after the place gets remodeled. Um, I know I'm missing something, but anyway. That's a lot of fish. Yeah, a lot of fish. Uh, on this side alone, well, the whole group, um, including the three hatcheries that I oversee, we about 2.5, 2.7 million fish. Wow. And, about a year? 2.5 million fish. Yeah. Wow. And that's with all those different stocks. And what can the students do to help their salmon? Well, probably the biggest one, um, you youngsters know what it, it kind of takes to raise them, but figure out what you can help in the wild. They need awesome water um, so we you know we don't want to play in streams the other parts we don't want to play in streams and make you know swimming areas because that defeats the purpose of them coming in and out so water quality is a big thing what, what you can do to help with that uh, and you guys tested your water every week and you know how it can be up and down and it's hard to get it nice yes and so when you're out out and about you know um, if you see some garbage um, along a stream, that, that'll, that'll very much help um, the native salmon and that kind of stuff. You know, just I guess be, just be mindful of what you do in, in your everyday life. Could it affect the salmon or a fish or that kind of thing as, as you grow up? Um, and that's a big, big thing to, to think about. Um, you know, you will. We are the biggest predators of them all, um, as humans, and so it's up to us to do the little things um, to keep good water quality. Um, try to keep fertilizers out of, you know, if you live along a lake or along the river, you know, fertilizer can be very detrimental, causes algae growth. Uh, so yeah, a lot, a lot of things. Um, that we do as humans, we don't always think about, and it affects um, other things, wildlife, fish, that kind of stuff. So just be mindful of what you do today can affect five years down the road. If any of you youngsters, as you grow up through this and really like this, there's a lot of volunteer programs to be involved with, with um, uh, helping with the salmon uh, recovery, um, and other, uh, other type of activities. Um, well, thanks for having us out, Corey. You're and welcome. Talking to us about salmon and, and most importantly, helping us put the salmon in the stream that they're going to live in for a little bit of time. You know, October or something, um, we start seeing some adults come back. Oh. That kind of will give you the end, you know, it won't be your babies, but it'll be you know, their great, great grandparents yeah. um, that you can see kind of how they made the jaunt. So it's a long journey and they're able to sniff out where they were released. So these fish here 
will be sniffed out to this particular uh, chemistry of water, and that's where they'll come back to when they get ready. Alright, well thank you. Hope you guys enjoyed your field trip to the Chilean hatchery. And thank you for raising awesome salmon. Awesome job. Good job.